the game. Day one. Dear Penelope, they say that to achieve the impossible, it is precisely the unthinkable that must be thought. I am writing to you from unexpected quarters, Penelope, as I have been invested with a mission of utmost importance that will oblige me to do precisely that. To think thoughts that few in this place and time consider possible to contemplate which is in itself surprising, as they were not even that remarkable in a time not so distant from ours. But I am getting ahead of myself. Let me start from the beginning. I have been approached by a group of companies who operate at the very highest level in the technology field. I cannot tell you who they are, as even I do not know. My interlocutors identified themselves only as emissaries of the Invisible Consortium, whatever that may be. The need for secrecy, I was told, is owed to the fact that the Consortium considers the assignment they have entrusted me with too sensitive to be put down in writing, as the mere public knowledge of its existence could have a destabilizing effect on civil society. And indeed, I must say, the brief I have been handed is as astonishing as it is laconic. It consists of nothing more than one ticket to Longyearbyen in the Norwegian high arctic region of Svalbard, where I am to consider the problem of the nation's state in the light of its possible demise. That is it. Day 2. Dear Penelope, As you know, I do not travel by aeroplane, and the slow trip across the barren sea towards Svalbard has afforded plenty of time for reflection on my task. I should first of all clarify that the problem of the nation-state is, in fact, my own summarization and not theirs, as is the possibility of its demise. I am using these terms as a placeholder while I ponder what I am doing here. Their own exposition of the topic I was to research was muddled and incoherent to say the least, and littered with vague allusions to what they defined as the architecture of global control. I took this to be a reference to the proliferation of walls, fences, checkpoints, barriers, surveillance systems, militarized borderlands, and infrastructuralized frontiers we know all too well. In order to protect the neutrality of my scientific investigation, my handlers were careful to be vague about my client's own outlook on the matter, leaving me in doubt as to whether they viewed these instruments of global control with enthusiasm or concern. One theory that came to mind is that the Invisible Consortium's name could have been inspired by the Invisible Committee, which, as you will recall, is an obscure but influential anonymous French collective, invoking a mass uprising against capitalist culture. Maybe they fear the insurrection is finally coming and they wish to meet it well prepared. This makes sense on one level, as for all the libertarian free market bluster the market cap of technology mega corps does not generally flourish amidst anarchic revolutions. But if it were so, why Svalbard? Another possibility 
Could they be flirting with the idea of declaring themselves fully autonomous sovereign entities, complete with their own territories, perhaps in the Arctic? Ludicrous as it sounds, the preconditions exist. Google would be 59th in the world by GDP if it were a country, and Facebook will be 90th. Even Spotify's annual turnover is larger than Malta's. What is more, there is at least one historical precedent for such an arrangement. During the mid-1700s, the greater part of the Indian subcontinent found itself under the rule of the East India Company, which ran its own private military, collected taxes from the population, and even had its own flag. So ruthlessly efficient did the company become that at one point, that it alone accounted for half of the world's trade, which is something I can imagine more than one member of the consortium aspires to. No, Penelope, none of these theories hold water. I have become convinced that the motivation for the consortium's interest in this place are less conspiratorial. They are likely hidden in plain sight, or perhaps somewhere in the fold of Svalbard's history. But I have kept you too long already. More tomorrow. Day 3. Dear Penelope, I wish to share with you some brief notes on my Arctic environs. What I find hardest to picture in my mind is just how far north the Svalbard archipelago is. Its southernmost point is almost 1,000 kilometers north of even the most northern tip of the Norwegian mainland, which means that I am presently far closer to the North Pole than to Oslo. Longyearbyen, the capital, as well as the only town worthy of such a title, is humanity's final frontier. It is the northernmost human settlement on Earth, and the only people further north than me at present are the scientists rotating through research outposts such as Nye Ellisund, or the occasional millionaire adventurer who has paid a handsome fee for dog sled junket to the pole. This is a hostile land, Penelope, whose history and landscape have been forged through sheer resolution by trappers, prospectors, and hardy capitalists. And each has left their mark. As you might have already guessed, the name Longyearbyen itself is just such a mark. It intends to commit unto eternity the memory of John Munro Longyear, an enterprising American industrialist who was to become a pivotal figure in polar history. Longyear first travelled to Svalbard aboard the SS August Victoria with his wife and seven children in the summer of 1901, rather before such polar adventures became fashionable. The story of the August Victoria is in itself interesting, as she was the first European liner with twin screws, a technological innovation which made her the fastest liner in the Atlantic trade when she entered service in 1889. This was an important advantage in an industry which at the time consisted exclusively of ferrying passengers as quickly as possible from Europe to America and back. She also achieved levels of luxury previously unseen with what one historian described as a Rococo stair hall, illuminated by a milky way of pear-shaped prisms and naked light bulbs. 
clutched by gilded cherubs, a reception court choked by palm trees, and a dark and gothic smoking room. The August Victoria was immediately successful, but she proved to be an economic drain on the line because she required more coal than slower ships and could not carry much freight or many steerage passengers. Seeking higher profit margins than transportation alone could offer, her owners began to market her instead as a floating luxury hotel whose purpose was recreational rather than practical. The August Victoria's pleasure voyage in the Mediterranean and the Near East from the 22nd of January to the 22nd of March 1891, with 241 passengers aboard, including her owners, is widely considered to have been the first ever cruise. After the August Victoria cast anchor in Ifs Jordan on the 15th of July 1901, Longyear was ashore at Advent Point to take leisurely walks on long beaches that today flank the town that bears his name, the Mining Hall of Fame, into which Longyear was posthumously inducted in 2005, informs us that since his early days as a developer of the rich iron mines of the Lake Superior region, he had possessed a nose for ore that was unmatched in the prospecting industry. And in Ifs Jordan, that nose smelled coal. Over the following years, he made several more exploratory visits to Svalbard and founded the Arctic Coal Company in 1905. Through this company, Longyear bought the Norwegian claims on the west side of Avon Jordan, installed his nephew William D. Munro as general manager, and proceeded to set up a mechanized mining operation comprising extensive shipping facilities, aerial ropeways, a power station, and an expansive mining camp. This camp, with the congenital modesty of a captain of industry, he designated Longyear City. Day 4. Dear Penelope, I cannot contain my excitement this morning, as I am now entirely convinced that my intuitions are correct, and there can be no question why I am here. This is what I have found. Unlike other unclaimed territories, which historically have been acquired by discovery or by force, Svalbard became part of Norway by international agreement. In 1920, at the end of the Great War, World powers feared conflict could arise out of the archipelago's status as terra nullius, a no man's land. So the treaty signed in Versailles handed full and absolute sovereignty over Svalbard to Norway, which was neutral during the conflict. Crucially though, the same treaty also limited Norway's sovereignty by subjecting it to a set of unique rules, rules which forbade discrimination on the basis of nationality and provided equal access to Svalbard for all world citizens. That might sound inconsequential, but maybe you are starting to see where I am heading. Through a series of historical circumstances the Versailles signatories cannot have foreseen, where I am now is the only place on earth that officially requires no visa, permit, or other form of government permission 
in order to reside here and to work. Dear Penelope, I feel the pieces are now truly falling into place. The Invisible Consortium is a consortium of pragmatists, and, as far as they can see, the writing is on the wall. It is as clear to them, as to the rest of us, that the current world order is unsustainable, and year by year requires more walls, borders, technology, and military might to hold up. Yet, even all the money, and all the might in the world, cannot overcome the human instinct to stream, trickle, and spill out, and then surge like breakers across the face of the planet, reaching into every crevice like a rising tide. We have built a world which is too unequal for any other future to be possible. Yes, the current order is unsustainable, and they want to be ready for the next. I am convinced I am here to study the possibility of a world without borders. Day 5 Dear Penelope, I am as convinced as ever of my purpose in this place, but I realise that in my excitement I stated it somewhat imprecisely in my last letter. To speak of a world without borders, as I did, would be to consider the problem from the perspective of the existing order of things, but this is the wrong approach. It is not borders in themselves I am here to question, but their raison d'etre, and this is why I consider my initial intuition to be correct. What is at stake is indeed the problem of the nation-state. But what is a nation-state without borders? I hear you exclaim, since little is more unthinkable from the perspective of an observer whose perception is that of late capitalism. I assure you, however, that this perception is a historical fallacy. In the early 19th century, Jean Bouvier defined the state as a self-sufficient body of persons united together in one community for the defense of their rights, and to do right and justice to foreigners. None of the definitions he or other political scholars of the time put forward explicitly referenced territory. Indeed, late medieval and early modern legal thought rarely contained any limits upon his theoretical territorial scope of the state, preferring instead to demarcate spatial limits by reference to the limits of actual power. The 19th century, by contrast, has been described as an age of territoriality, as an age when states, to use one popular definition, attempts to influence, affect, or control objects, peoples, and relationships by delimiting and asserting control over a geographic area. It is only in the past two centuries, in other words, that explicit references to territory begin to appear in definitions of the state. I tell you all this not only to set the record straight, but because the topic came up in a conversation earlier today. I have decided to use interviews as my primary instrument of research, simple, informal, and loosely structured conversations with the people I meet. My instinct tells me that with ideas as unorthodox as these, nothing will be quite as revealing as the Vox Populi. I must say my client's idea of sending me to Svalbard is quite brilliant, as it unburdens me entirely of the rather tiresome arguments I would have to slog through anywhere else. It's hard to insist that borders which do not discriminate based on nationality or place of origin is utterly unthinkable when you're literally standing within them. Anyway, back to the interview. This morning I struck up a conversation with three plucky young sailors who set sail from Brittany ten weeks ago in a thirty-foot sloop and are now moored in almost the exact same spot in which Longyear alighted from the August Victoria a hundred and twenty years ago. And the visa will... I think it's not going to be suppressed anytime soon because of that, because all the government will fear that they... I don't know what, what they really fear, but they want to, to keep control on the migration flow, that, that's for sure. But then, I don't really know, but if, if they don't have that kind of control, who, yeah, what, will shit really happen? Not sure. <laughs> Thank you.
Mm. Borders in the South are, I think, a replica of borders, of the way borders have been conceived and defined in the North. Personally, I think that borders may exist, may exist, administrative, regional, geographical borders, borders control and border, border monitoring should not. But why should it imply that this border will be monitored, that it will, it will be controlled and that any power or any actor will have a, a monopoly, a monopoly on, on it? It's a different question and the fact that the border exists should not necessarily imply that it is controlled and monitored. Day 6 Dear Penelope, Today we accept the tediousness of border checks, passport formalities and visas as an inevitable part of the experience of travel. Little do most people know that they are just one more of the countless miseries WW1 visited upon our world. I came across a passage by the Austrian novelist Stefan Zwig, which sums it up well. Before 1914, he writes, the earth belonged to the entire human race. Everyone could go where he wanted and stay there as long as he liked. No permits or visas were necessary, and I am always enchanted by the amazement of young people when I tell them that before 1914, I traveled to India and America without a passport. Indeed, I had never set eyes on a passport. You boarded your means of transport and got off it again, without asking or being asked any questions. You didn't have to fill in a single one of the hundred forms required today. No permits, no visas, nothing to give you trouble. The borders that today, thanks to the pathological distrust felt by everyone for everyone else, are a tangled fence of red tape where there are nothing but symbolic lines on the map. And you cross them as unthinkingly as you can cross the meridian in Greenwich. Well, as they say, the past truly is a foreign country. The passport as we know it today has its origins in the Paris Conference on Passports and Custom Formalities and Through Tickets of 1920. The conference's purpose was to ratify a set of harmonized standards for all passports issued by members of the League. Prior to that, there were no internationally agreed standards for passports, simply because they were not generally required for travel. It took all the misery, displacement and inequality of a global war to make mass relocation a reality at such a scale that it needed to be regulated. And even then, the use of passports was only intended as a provisional measure, in anticipation of, quote, a complete return to pre-war conditions which the conference hopes, nevertheless, to see gradually re-established in the near future.
Day 7 Dear Penelope, a quick note over breakfast, as I prepare myself for the next interview. I made it my mission today to make contact with a quintessentially Svalbardian character, an American journalist who relocated to Long Bayan 13 years ago, and, thanks to the lack of work restrictions, was able to set up an English-language newspaper which has become a reference point for the community. Having benefited substantially from the model of governance I am researching, I am expecting him to be one of the more vocal supporters of the idea of extending it elsewhere. So, my answer would be no, I don't think the Svalbard Treaty can usefully be implemented. Uh, pretty much anywhere else mm. on earth. Mm. Um, you just don't have a place that is as, as neutral in theory as this is. Yeah. That'd be chaos. You couldn't do it. Um, what do you think would happen? Well, you couldn't do it for any number of reasons. It's so, it's so complicated to ask, uh, what if you just made the Svalbard Treaty applicable like worldwide? There's simply too many economic, political, religious, and so on. Uh, uh, divisions among different people, countries, and so on and so forth, it would never work. I mean, just starting with uh, Israel and Palestine to begin with, I mean, try to imagine them operating on it and then apply that to any of a hundred other divisions around uh, the world, and that's just uh, countries and people for one thing based on religion. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I don't mean to insult you, but it's a stupid it's a stupid thought. You couldn't. It's impossible. Globally, no. Um, so globally, you think b borders are necessary? Borders have, yeah, borders exist for reasons. And um, sometimes uh, those reasons, uh, it can be argued, are not, uh, are not good ones. And uh, sometimes uh, when they lock people in instead of keeping people from coming in, for example, that might not be good. There are times when... Uh, some place might close its borders to the extent uh, it's not good for the country that closes them or the people trying to get there for whatever reason. Um, and there are a great many uh, reasons you could argue uh, that uh, everything had to do from trade to uh, folks who are from to refugees to uh, simple things like tourism and travel and the economy. Um, so. Uh, they're necessary, but, and I wouldn't even say there's one set of rules that works uh, for all borders. Day 8. Dear Penelope. States are inveterate wall builders. The construction of barriers, both physical and legal, is the oldest function of state-like entities. Even the Epic of Gilgamesh, written 4,000 years ago, begins with that famous boast. This is the wall of Uruk, which no city on earth can equal. It might have something to do with yesterday's conversation with the journalist, but today I am racked by doubts, and my mission here suddenly seems futile. Yes, if the present order collapses, a new one will emerge, and its selfhood will take form through a renewed physical and juridical architecture of walls, Barriers, defensive structures, dividing lines, limits, thresholds, registries of belonging, permits and laissez passes Just like everyone before and everyone after it. For the first time, I am beginning to suspect I have fallen victim to a trap laid for me by my client. Could it be that, blinded by my own optimism, I am making myself instrumental in advancing the corrupt interests of the Invisible Consortium? How am I to know their motives are sincere, and that their ambition truly is, as I have naively assumed, to participate in overcoming the inequality and injustice built into every constituent part of the current order of things? Isn't it more likely that my research will serve as the cornerstone for a new and even more oppressive order, one probably based on some kind of pay-as-you-go subscription service, knowing them? What is more, the more people I talk to, the less they really seem to care. I think it's positive. Yeah, I don't... 
I don't know what to say about that. Uh, it's uh, some kind of normal. I think it's okay. I don't know. I really don't know. I think it's special for this place. So no, I don't think it will work uh, the same in, um, in uh, Norway. No, I just don't think. <laughs> I don't know why. Mm. I don't know. I don't think it. I don't think it will work. I don't know what to say about that. Sorry. <laughs>
In Berensburg, I had the opportunity to pay a visit to the world's northernmost statue of Lenin, his contemplative gaze keeping watch over a strange landscape of artifacts, produced by a political order as distant and inscrutable to us today as the one I am here to imagine. Dear Penelope, something marvellous happened today, and it has entirely turned my mood around. Having returned to Long Bayan and to the lodgings booked for me by my client at the Radisson, I headed for a quick bite at the Nansen, which is a sports gastropub within the hotel with a wonderful view of its Jordan. The Nansen, I should point out, is named in honour of the Norwegian polar explorer Fridtjof Nansen, who is a giant among Arctic travellers albeit rather less of a household name than Roald Amundsen. He was a pioneer of both neurology and oceanography and a complex zoologist, and the first to cross the Greenland interior in 1888, traversing the island on cross-country skis. I had the vague recollection that he was also the recipient of a Nobel Prize, which I had assumed was awarded for his work as a scientist. The truth, as it turns out, is far more extraordinary. After reaching a record northern latitude of 86 degrees 14 during his Fram expedition of 1893 to 1896, Nansen retired from exploration, devoting himself instead to humanitarian causes. In 1920, following the same Treaty of Versailles previously mentioned, the League of Nations was formed, and in recognition of his deep compassion for his fellow human beings, Nansen was made High Commissioner for Refugees. In this role, he set about applying his considerable intelligence to what was easily the most titanic problem facing post-war Europe. What to do about the millions of people, mostly Russian, but also Turks, Kurds, Syrians, and Jews, displaced by political events surrounding the greatest conflict in history. The matter was further complicated by the provisions laid out in the same year at the same Paris conference on passports I mentioned in a previous letter. For the first time, the right to free movement was linked to the possession of a state-issued document, the passport, which refugees by definition did not possess. To paraphrase Paul Virilio, to create the state is to also create the stateless. What to do with these millions of stateless people, liminal figures who threaten the social stability by virtue of their existence? outside of the newly constituted social order. Nansen's solution was to create what became known as the Nansen Passport, effectively a passport for the stateless, a certificate that could be issued by European governments to non-nationals, and which, thanks to the diplomatic efforts of Nansen's office, was recognized by more than 50 countries. It was for this commitment to act as ambassador of last resort for those whose identity was erased by the new world order that Nansen was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1922. Since this is Svalbard, the last remaining patch of Earth that does not discriminate based on place of origin, I find myself wondering whether it was in fact Nansen's work for the stateless that the Radisson executives intended to commemorate. And what about my mission here? Can the fact I find myself writing to you from a restaurant named after this great man be pure coincidence? Can I go so far as to suppose that the invisible consortium wishes to reassure me that its commitment to justice and equality is genuine? Whatever the answer to these questions may be, I feel my sense of purpose is back. They should be free to move wherever they want, I guess. It's your, you as a human should be free to choose <laughs> where you want to live, where you want to go. Oh, I think you want to be really chaotic. <laughs> um, have you heard about the new law? It's not a law yet. Um, the Norwegian government's it's suggesting that 
um, the foreigners in Longyearbyen Bjorn can't vote. <laughs> That's kind of messed up. I, I th- Nor- Norway is a democratic country. And even though we're not fully Norway, Svalbard still is a part of Norway. So you can't just take the right to vote from people just because not because they're not from your country or you have your citizenship. So. Day 10. Dear Penelope, I was interested in hearing the view of a young immigrant, and the Thai community is one of the most populous here. So I set out to speak to one of its members. This morning, I had an enlightening conversation with a young lady whose family had moved to Longyearbyen from Bangkok some 14 years ago. She alerted me to the fact that the Norwegian government had, in recent months, been floating the idea of modifying Svalbard's electoral law in such a way that in practice, only Norwegians could retain the right to vote. I frankly cannot see how this could be even remotely compatible with the non-discriminatory framework of the Svalbard Treaty. So I have for the moment dismissed it as political bluster. Nevertheless, it prompted me to set up an appointment with the governor in order to explore his views, as a representative of the state, on what would happen if the Svalbardian experiment was scaled up to a planetary level. He was non-committal and referred most of my inquiries to his superiors in Oslo. World system is uh, based on the, the, the national nationality and uh, and the borders, but uh, in the new world maybe maybe it's rather important for the population, I think. And uh, there are big discussion between the, the local community here and the, the, the government. In, uh, in but is it compatible with the treaty? Because the treaty speaks about he, he treating everybody. The same. I think you must uh, give that answer to the. the Minister of uh, Justice and uh, in, in Norway, yeah. I don't think it's an uh, effective problem when it comes to Svalbard, the, the, the freedom of movement because of uh, the harsh uh, winter and cold. It's just an interesting thought experiment. I'm not really sure how that would work. I think that Svalbard is like a, a very, it has a d- stature in the world as this place where you can come and, and, and do this. But I'm not really sure if uh, the human, uh, <laughs> what do you call it, uh, psyche is, is ready for doing that somewhere else. But uh, it would be interesting to see. Maybe it's kind of like a tribal thing that we need states, we need nationalities sort of to to not be too big because when you become too big it becomes... uh, I don't know, I think maybe uh, you need to have this uh, idea in your mind of someone else and that you are different from them not in a sort of like like enemy type thing but just like it's, it's. I think the humans like having smaller groups. Yeah, I think in Norway the, it's been a big battle for the Samis to to get recognized, and it started in the eighties, seventies, and eighties. The big, uh, like then they started to assert that we are a people. We we want to be recognized as that, and for them. The borders between Sweden and Norway and Finland and Russia is, is like they're just on the map because a lot of them, at least if you go to the reindeer herding Samis, their reindeer don't know these borders. And, you know, as long as there are no fences, they don't care. They just go where there's food with the Internet and everything with Facebook and all these things, they make the world so connected that in a way it kind of threatens our evolutionary tribal system you know we're not ready for all this technology i think that that's going to be a big issue and that i think is also part of why you see nationalism growing in europe 
in other parts of the world in Brazil, because I think we kind of came ahead of ourselves with old technology, and 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 it's hard for the brain and the to f f catch up, sort of. Day eleven. Dear Penelope, my work must be getting to me, as last night I had the most bizarre and terrifying dream. I had the body of a crash test dummy, and I found myself in a desert region, desperate to find safety on the other side of a border. I resorted to the most unorthodox strategies, but no matter what I did, I was apprehended by border patrol vehicles. The whole thing had the surreal atmosphere of a video game. I woke up with a start, thinking about an interview I once saw with a group of refugees who were attempting the crossing into the EU via Serbia. One had been beaten and pushed back 22 times by the Hungarian police. They called the border crossing the game, they said, because it was so difficult. Well, my immediate thought is uh, this would never work in Europe. If there was a treaty allowing every country in Europe to work across the borders. But I've never actually thought about why wouldn't it work, you know? And the issues we have here, I believe, is purely economic. Uh, we argue about who has the rights to this coal mountain, who has the rights to this oil in the ground, you know? Um, but further than that, I'm not, like, what issues would one face? I think there will come up points where the global issues will overcome the political um, argumentations. So you know there will, there will come a time where the climate uh, change and where the um, immigration will be such a huge problem that we'll have to set aside the politics of it. And it might be in 10 years, 20, 100. I don't know, but I think that will be the starting point of the of a country and a world without borders. I believe so. But it, until now, I can't I can't see the possibility of a Europe uh, working without borders because the politics are way too. There's such a huge difference, especially in Europe, between the countries and the cultural meanings. And we're starting to see signs of it now with the focus on climate change and Greta Thunberg and you know um, but I, I, st I think it will still be some time until this will be such a huge problem that we say we're all gonna die if we don't do something right now and that will trump the, the need of borders and the need of money and the economic side of it all so I think that will be the turning point of the way we see the world as we do today. Day 12. Dear Penelope, I feel my time here is drawing to an end. I am starting to recognize, belatedly perhaps, some fallacies in my line of reasoning up to this moment. The first was to consider the question exclusively in terms of the state. It is true that in 1918, Max Weber defined the state as a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given domain. The modern state, one might say, forms at the intersection of violence and territory, but this does not make the state the sole arbiter of exclusion and inequality. The second, which is related to the first, was to immediately adopt a mechanistic view of the question, 
as if one's condition were a binary matter of whether one finds oneself inside or outside a wall. For those playing the game, crossing the fence is just the first level, and not even the hardest. You see, even within these walls, there is a secession taking place. The internet is giving birth to new worlds, cloud communities built around shared interests, which take physical shape with the creation of new neighbourhoods, new cities, and, who knows, even new countries. The outcome is a new world of groups living side by side without any common identity nor reciprocal obligation. The prototype is today's San Francisco, the first cloud community turned physical, where the tech crowd, with its camaraderie and its informal safety net, lives alongside, but not together with, a community of destitute and new servants. It's no wonder that these companies, who I assume to be my clients, tend to be led by strong personalities and often resemble more benevolent dictatorships than democracies. What I am saying is that once we have torn down all the walls, our work will only have just begun. The more I think about it, the more I find the sheer scope of this assignment overwhelming, yet I cannot pull myself back now. A new theory is shaping in my mind. Could it be that there is no such thing as the invisible consortium? Surely no CEO in their right mind would give the game away in such a brazen fashion. What if I was sent here by a whistleblower, or some kind of insider, who wishes to alert me to the nefarious machinations of their corporate superiors? I intend to make my own way to Silicon Valley to find out. Dear Penelope, You will not hear from me for a while as the voyage to America is long. Believe it or not, I am more optimistic than ever about my mission. I can vividly see an image from my childhood, which is indelibly burned into my mind. It is an image of schoolgirls in Myanmar, running back and forth, playing Hetot Sihot, the border-crossing game. The only thing you see that is more deeply rooted in human nature than the instinct to build borders is the impulse to overcome them.